Hello and welcome to another in the series of 10 Principles to National Renewal, our Rebuilding America series. I'm Sam Rohr, and I'm going to be joined uh, uh, in today's part two of this principle six, The Tendency of Government by Isaac Crockett. He'll be with me in just a moment. But last week we presented the historical precedent of governments becoming tyrannical and how that all government, because they are run by sinful and depraved mankind, will also seek to consolidate power. Now today we'll identify the second tendency of government, and that is to usurp worship from God Himself. From creation, God made mankind in His image and gave Him the ability to know and worship Him. But with the advent of the fall and sin entering the world, mankind fell into a depraved state with a, a heart of rebellion against God and His authority and His plan for mankind. William Penn viewed the role of government under God, the need for just law to support the intents of God, and as he said for mankind to act in positions of government, having once repented of their sins and accepted Jesus Christ by faith. These things had to happen, he said, or you could not have freedom. Now, his understanding caused him to say this in part. This is something that William Penn said. He said, said so, he said, government seems to me to be a part of religion itself, a sacred, sacred in its institution and its end. For if government does not directly remove the cause referring to evil, the cause of evil sin, it crushes the effects of evil, and is, as such, although a lower, yet they said an emanation of the same divine power, meaning it's given of God, God who is both author and object of pure religion. He said, he went on to say, he said, had Adam never fell, that sacred purpose and divine relationship between God and mankind, he's saying, would have continued among men on earth under the highest of purposes. They may arrive at, by the coming, he said, at the blessed second Adam, the Lord from heaven. You know, like every aspect of man's thinking and actions, including government and governmental policy, nothing happens by accident. From the beginning, as we've cited many times during this series, God laid out a plan. He promises blessings if obedience is observed, and He promises the most severe cursings and judgment if He is rejected and His commandments are spurred. And I cite again a key passage we've cited before, Deuteronomy chapter 28, 1 and 2, and then verse 15. Listen to this. God says there, If you hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and do all His commandments which I command you this day, then I will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and literally overtake you. But it shall come to pass, if you will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, to observe His commandments and His statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon you, and they will overtake you. So despite this promise and warning from God, Without a redeemed heart, mankind in government will always tend to walk the pathway to rebellion and bondage. Hmm. Isaac, last program I started by asking you to give a quote from somebody in history past that our founders referred to that have truths that apply to the day. But for this purpose today of then demonstrating that this concept of government tends to consolidate power and to literally, as we're talking in this program, ultimately to try to usurp the proper worship of God. Give us some examples. I, I think one of my favorite places to go to, to see the, the bad example versus the good example is the book of Daniel. Uh, because Daniel, he does not let the power and influence that God gives him go to his head. He keeps the Lord in his heart. So he starts out with King Nebuchadnezzar, who, you know, he's in charge of Babylon, which you know, many historians believe that's tied all the way back to Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. Um, and he's so proud and so confident in himself. You know, we have the whole uh, the, the fiery furnace because the, the Hebrew children won't bow to his image. Uh, we have him being made like a beast for seven years because he wouldn't humble himself before the Lord. 
And then eventually, um, you know, his kingdom is taken over by the Medes and Persians. It's still under Daniel's lifetime. And King Darius of the Persian uh, king, he really likes Daniel and he promotes Daniel. And meanwhile, all this time, Daniel keeps getting promoted in these different kingdoms and he stays humble before God and relying upon God. These other kings like your pharaohs and Caesars of history, they think they are God. And, uh, and so here's Darius and these guys come up to him and say, hey, you know, we want this new law made that nobody can worship anybody. No praying, no petitioning of any God except for you. You're the only God for 30 days. And he says, you know, this sounds pretty good. And he signs it into decree and, uh, uh, and then, you know, they use it against Daniel and he, you know, he learns his lesson. And so it's neat to see God showing us good example of Daniel versus these bad examples of what naturally our, our fallen nature naturally goes to. So uh, we, we have a lot of neat things to talk about when we dig into the Bible to find out about what's going on even today and these natural tendencies of government and of the human heart. We have more to come uh, just after this. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator, or frontline combatant. Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping, this is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Well, welcome back. And I want to go back to Isaac here. Isaac, you just, um, in that first segment, um, uh, I asked you to give a, a, an example of governments and you went to the Babylonian, you went mm -hmm. to Nebuchadnezzar, and we know the story of Nebuchadnezzar and Darius. Um, you could have gone much further because even going up to the Roman times, the Caesar said, yeah, we're a God. And that was part of the issue the Christians of old got in conflict with that. It's not something new. I mean, communism mm -hmm. of today, frankly, uh, really say by the fact that they outlaw any worship of God, they are saying by, by the result of that is we are. Mm -hmm. We're better than God. So it's nothing new. But you also cited um, Babylon and you cited Babel. Mm -hmm. And on the last program, one of the things about Nimrod and the Tower of Babel was they consolidated political power, which the tendency of government, but they also had a spiritual component too. So go back there and let's visit that because again, this principle we're talking about today, not only does government, civil authority left unsubmitted or un, um, not subservient to the God of heaven and God's plan will not only consolidate power so that people will use the sword to force people to do their way, but they start to begin to think that they're God too, don't they? Yeah, you, you, you got it. Um, and, and Satan's game plan, his tactics don't seem to change in a lot of ways uh, over history. So all the way back in Genesis 11, and last time that we talked about this in part one of this program, we said in, in a lot of ways, this appears to be one of the clearest forms of government first stated in the Bible. And that's uh, the group there in Babel and their leader, according to the Talmud and other Jewish writings, as well as other historians, uh, they credit Nimrod, which makes sense because when we read in the genealogies, Nimrod uh, was this mighty one on earth who seems to be standing against God and uh, he has the beginning of his kingdom. It's listed as Babel in the land of Shinar. Well, that, you know, fits with Babel, the tower, Babylon, the, the empire. And so what we see here is that in chapter 8 of Genesis, Noah and his sons, which includes Ham, the, the um, one who, who Nimrod comes from, they are told to go and to, you know, subdue the earth and to multiply and be fruitful. And, and it would appear that God's sending them out to spread across his creation. And instead, they try to consolidate into one group so that they can build their way up to heaven and basically literally put themselves up 
in the place of God, literally in his place. And God, of course, humiliates them. He changes their languages and things. Uh, but they were trying to come together as one. And it says the whole earth was of one language and one speech. And, you know, this is in Genesis chapter 11. And they're all there in the same place. And isn't that interesting that we see at the very end of the Bible, if we go from Genesis then to Revelation, that in the in, you know, time of the Antichrist, it's going to be a one world order. And uh, so, you know, in many ways, Satan's tactics have not changed. It's just been different time and different cultures. But uh, all the way through, um, Babylon tried to do this. Uh, Medes and Persians tried to do this. The Caesars tried to do this. Egypt tried. I mean, that's in the heart of man uh, is to to rule in God's place. And uh, Hmm. speaking of ruling in God's place, you have ruled as a minister of God, not just as a leader in your church, but as a leader in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for almost 20 years um, in politics, in government, I should say. What are maybe some practical examples that you've learned being on that side of, of the aisle, so to speak? Uh, Isaac, that's a, that's a good question. I, you know what, and as you were describing that, um, people seek to not walk together. People mm-hmm. have a tendency to want to walk in groups, kind of like birds in a flock, or, you know, to stand together. Now, in a, under God's plan, He would have us be unified mm-hmm. under our obedience to Him. As believers in Jesus Christ, one of the marks, the strongest mark, is that we love the brethren and we are in unity with God's plan. But see, the devil is always seeking to create unity also. (laughs) But it has nothing to do with love, and it has the opposite to do with God Himself. So the devil is a counterfeiter from the beginning. Hmm. Uh, He he counterfeited, and the Antichrist that you referred to coming out of the Babylon system, the Tower of Babel system of worship, will seek to unify the world through lies, not the truth, Mm. through the rejection of God, not the acceptance of God, and government, the authority of government, we explained from Romans 13, the authority of civil government that God gives the power, the sword to actually imprison people. If that sword of authority is not voluntarily submitted, as William Penn said and other founders said, to the will of God, to the moral commands of God, that sword will no longer swing in the protection of those who do right. It will swing in persecution against those who do right biblically. That's why in these days we're seeing such a rise of persecution around the world. And even in our own country sitting here, we're seeing laws in the justice system being subverted and turned against people so that those who say, I have a conviction, I live by conviction, I, I, I'm, I believe in Jesus Christ, a, liar, a law higher than government, we are now being identified as the problem. Why is that? Because we have a civil authority that is run by people who have rejected the God of heaven. And so, so what does government try to do. Well, one of the things I found from being in government, and people can see right now, is that government tries to act as if they uh, are God. I, mm. I, I noted a, a, a couple of things is that, think of this, when God says, here's my law, the Ten Commandments, what does unredeemed man in government say when they say, I don't want to do what God says? Well. Well, I go back to the 1960s when our Supreme Court, the supreme law of the land said, we don't want our children in schools praying to God. Mm. We're going to make it illegal. Um, We don't want the Ten Commandments, which if we don't submit ourselves to that, we're going to be ruled by tyrants, which is what uh, Penn said, and he's correct. Uh, Our Supreme Court, our highest civil authorities of the land said, no more Ten Commandments on the walls of our schools. And then we go to 1973, Isaac, and the courts and governments and state legislatures across the country say, life is not sacred in the womb. Hmm. It's okay to kill them. That sounds like Babylon. 
That sounds like Baal worship of the old days. We kill our babies. But is that not an act of saying, God? We're God. Hmm. We make the rules. You don't make the rules about morality and life and what's right and wrong. No. We make it. That's an example. Uh, another example in a practical sense is that when government um, learns how the people in government learn that they can actually take money from the people <laughs> through taxes, and again, our founders in history told us, once people learn to vote themselves largesse from the public treasury, they, that republic is nigh on dead. Well, look what we have. We're trillions of dollars in debt as a nation, and debt will take down this nation. Well, who hands out that money? Who takes that money? By theft, those in office. Why do they think they can? Because they think they're God. They don't, they don't say that this money belongs to the people. They say it's them. And then what do they do? They turn around and they hand it out as if they are God. And when people take it, they stand up and take the credit. <laughs> Rather than deferring to the God of heaven as a minister of God, which is what in Romans 13 says, a minister of God will defer glory to the God of heaven, they seek the glory of God, and they take the glory of God, and they usurp it. So that would be one, just a it, it's just so clear, Isaac. Well, these are good practical applications, unfortunately, even from your own experience. What are some biblical, uh, maybe the opposite of this, how, how could we even in this setting turn to the Bible and see, you know, an explanation of how government should work? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say governments, when we do what the Bible says, God says, as I read from Deuteronomy at the beginning of this, uh, of this, um, this, this program today, he said, you do, you keep my commandments, you fear God and you keep my commandments, my blessings will become so prominent you can't, you can't handle them. Like mm. drinking out of a fire hose. <laughs> but if you turn away, then you are going to develop my judgment. And I'm just going to take past, I, won't, I can't build it out here right now, but, 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 but ladies and gentlemen, I would encourage you to do this. Open up your Bibles um, and go to Deuteron I mean, go to Ezekiel chapter 22. Begin in verse 25 and go to the end of the chapter. It says in verse 25, I'm just going to just give you some highlights. But this is what it's like when people in government and the people themselves turn away from the God of heaven. It says here, there is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst, referring to Israel, they're like roaring lions ravening the prey. Verse 26, her priests have violated my law, profaned my holy things. Put no difference between the holy and the profane. Just like I talked about our Supreme Court making rules to say that abortion's fine and, and marriage, you can define whatever you be. And then verse 27, her princes in the midst thereof. And then it comes in verse 29, the people of the land. What scripture identifies there are the, the prophets. They're the lawmaking branch. They're the forth tellers of truth. The priests at your judicial branch, they're the ones who are supposed to maintain the law and keep it in place. The princes are your executive branch. They're the enforcers of the law. But you see in this verses, when you go there and you look at it, you'll find that they have all worked together in a literal conspiracy. There's a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. The prophets and the leaders in government How'd they defraud their people? How'd they turn their people into widows? They removed them from the truth of God's Word, and they took to themselves, and they defined what they wanted to be truth. And the result of it is, they ended up oppressing each other, and stealing money from the people, and oppressing, and working together to get gain for each other. It's called bribery. It's called corruption. But lest you think it's the people that is the, those in office that were the problem, Verse 29, the people of the land, they've also used oppression. It's a reflect, a culture goes together. It starts with you, it starts with me, it's reflected in office. Isaac, let me go to you here because we've shared some of the cause, we've walked away from it. We'll try to wrap up a little bit by giving a solution. Now, okay, we've painted a picture. Uh, give some solution here to um, how well, we fix ourselves in this You know, we, we need personal as well as national renewal. We don't get national renewal mm -hmm without personal. You can put the Ten Commandments back in schools or whatever you want, but if there's no personal redemption, 
then it, you know, it, it doesn't go very far. And so as individuals, each of us needs to understand what we pointed out, I think it was uh, number three, that we have this, this depravity, that, that our nature is not good. And, um, and so we, we need checks and balances because of that all along the way. And so personally, we need to be redeemed. We need God to buy us back. We need to accept what Jesus Christ has done by, by sacrificing himself, dying and rising again from the dead, that we as sinners, we cannot be good on our own. We need the salvation of Jesus Christ. And then as a nation, that we need to be God-fearing. We need to have that personal relationship. But as a nation, we need to have the fear of God. Uh, in our, our currency, it says, in God we trust. We need to. And I've seen a bumper sticker that instead of saying, God bless America, it says, America bless God. And you don't normally get your theology from a bumper sticker, hmm. but that's actually pretty good. America needs to turn to God hmm. and bless God and do what God says is blessed. Um, so uh, we'll be right back with the last part of this segment talking about uh, our government and how we can have national renewal. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. So, Sam, as we come to the, the last part now, part two of uh, the sixth principle, can you maybe tie this in with the previous five and just kind of uh, fit this in with this, this overall, the ten principles to national renewal that we're covering? Uh, Isaac, I can. Again, we're talking today about um, this is, in essence, these ten principles are God's plan for a blessed nation. Mm. We're talking about those things that very serious people at the beginning of our country who came here, the Puritans, the Pilgrims, William Penn who came after, the signers of the Declaration of Independence, they came and they said, we don't like the history of the world living under tyrants. We have an opportunity to create a nation blessed of God. Where do we go? They went first to the Word of God. Then they went to history. We've talked about some of those examples today. And then they said, within Scripture, what does God tell us? They went to the nation of Israel. And they said, what did God tell Israel? Because what God put in the Old Testament is for our example. And they pulled out of those effectively ten principles, beginning with integrity beginning with understanding the knowledge and the nature of the character of God, perfect judge, creator, and then that the nature of man. He's a sinner. Man doesn't naturally do what's right. Mm -hmm. We do what is, we, we, we err right from our, our birth <laughs> uh, because we are born into sin. But thank the Lord there is redemption through Jesus Christ. That's the biblical worldview. That's a part of the whole story. But then all the way through from because of the nature of man, God said, well, to work out my plan of redemption, Jesus Christ through the nation of Israel, that's the reason for the authority of structure, the individual and family and civil. It's, and God works through nations. And the Bible says that. Why? So that God's plan of redemption has worked its way through. So you have the reason for government. That was another principle. And the reason for law and what constitutes good law versus bad law. And then into what we're talking about today. You get government in place and you have law. Well, if you don't have good people in place, and even if you mm. do, natural tendency of man is to say, hey, I like this power. I want more. And then they say, no, I like this power so much, I think I'm going to be God. They said you have to, and that works us to the next, actually the next principle for next week we'll get into that our founders identified was that knowing all these things, even though you have someone in government who goes in with the best intentions, and they say, really I want to be a servant mm -hmm. of the people. Yeah, I really want to do what's right. They will be, as Penn said, they will corrupt themselves because they are corrupted in their heart. And that's the next principle, number seven we'll talk about, is you have to put safeguards in place. And you used it, checks and balances. So ladies and gentlemen, next week, 
join us again because that'll be the next step, because even though you know what to do, the Bible puts checks and balances in place. Ever wonder why we have three branches of government? That's just, I'll give you one clue. It's there because God established it, but it's a check and balance, safeguards in the system. God's plan is beautiful. When we do what He says, He blesses, as Deuteronomy says, I'll pour out so many blessings that will overtake you. You disobey what I do, my cursings will overtake you. We want blessings in our nation again, we return to God. The sooner we do, the better. Thanks for watching us today. Pray for us. We'll see you next week.